All right, Lorenzo, now you've done it. You posted your comment uh, as of this filming two days ago, and I have struggled to answer. And the problem is how much the answer just kept exploding into fractals for me. It's an enormous topic. There's so much history and so many options and so many generalizations to kick to the curb. And uh, after a bit, I found I was writing an essay and then I realized it was a family of essays. And then I realized that I was just going mad. So here is a little video about a couple of things. And it's frustrating to me because this is just one of those little fractal sections that unfolds and unfolds and unfolds as you try to simply summarize it, get over it and move on to the next one for comparison. But no, this one. All right. So what am I talking about? I want to describe two games from roughly 25 years ago. We shall dial it back to the mid 90s. Both of these are games that I consider to be casualties in terms of the internet. In other words, they uh, were published very much in a non-internet mindset and a very um, characteristic of the time role-playing distribution retail store mindset. And neither, of course, uh, could possibly survive in that environment. And when the internet caught fire a bit later, there is a whole body of work of all kinds that was neither established enough for people to sort of culturally know and put on the internet, nor was it uh, able basically to gain traction in any way so that when the more developed form of the internet after 2000 really caught, um, these were left behind. So I don't even know if they're available in PDF or anything like that. So let's take a look at these two games, which are both relevant to the topic of what on earth are skills or what can be so-called skills in a role-playing game. Now, I chose this one because it was the one that actually kind of knocked me sideways in terms of what I had slowly and painfully come to think by the mid-90s in a very productive way, but it kept me from becoming an ideologue about that one particular trajectory of realization. So... That means before I introduce that game, we have to go to, you see what I mean about this fractal problem? Um, we would have to go to my distinction between first generation champions and the Iron Crown Enterprises fourth edition hero system champions. Um, and so struggling through that without summarizing too much um, and coming to grapple with the differences between, on the one hand, Rollmaster, Cyberpunk, and Over the Edge. Three different games that were on my mind as I was struggling with putting the first version of Sorcerer together. And what was I going to be using as kind of a personal model? Dialing all the way back to the fantasy trip, all sorts of things. Anyway, the point that I focused on was the notion of, de, uh, of of increasing the grain of the range of your character's skills. So instead of finer and finer grains, instead of developmental notions of what made you good at a skill and um, getting away from complicated point structures of getting better at them via play itself, trying to get away from all that and recognizing that some form of concept-driven, uh, non-specific mode of applying that aspect of your character's identity was functional. I looked at Amber, in which there are no listed skills, there are only attributes. And in fact, anything you call a skill is subsumed in one of the attributes. 
And which ones you're good at, well, it's pretty much assumed that you have a concept for your character and then you just roll with that. Um, something very similar is the case for Over the Edge. And I was thinking very much about that and how it all applied back to the fact that in early champions, there is no uh, points involved in anything but the most cinematic and comic book oriented skills, a very short list. And all those other skills and all sorts of aspects of mundane aspects of your character, including income, status, all sorts of other things, are not handled by points in that game. So thinking about all of that leads me to the concept of cover for sorcerer and so on. So basically, for lack of a better word, attribute driven skills are a conceptual subset or application of them. So I was really cooking on that mode of thought at the time and came perilously close to saying skill lists are bullshit, right? It was on a wrong turn, bad design. And then along came Shattered Dreams, which uh, was published in 1994 and is one of a bunch of games published just around that time, um, which are really a revolution. I mean, tremendously thoughtful games, really a lot of passion in all of them, um, and just steamroll, just ran face first into the destructive economics of role-playing at the time. Um, and really, you know, had no chance. So anyway, Shattered Dreams um, is, if you want, you know, it's a, a horror slash psych uh, dramatic game. And it is uh, extremely uh, oriented, I mean, toward a, a familiar trope. It's, it's dream walking, right? You're fighting people's neuroses in their dreams, but there are also monsters who travel through dream and are predatory and destructive and whatever. And you are in your dreams, a warrior against them traveling through the dream realms and so on. And you could be yawning at this point saying yawn, yawn, but really it's quite good in this case. And one of the things it's got is a bizarrely long and quirky skill list tons and tons of skills and they range from the most trivial things to extremely well skilled you know things so the whole gamut and at this point you're like wait a minute wait a minute is this one of these games where i actually have to you know like pay character points in order to know how to make toast and then i have to pay more character points if i you know want to be able to try to make an omelet to sit on the toast i mean is, is that what it's like and you're like well Almost, because instead of setting it up as sort of a conceptual or concentric hierarchy of skills, which is what most of the games with long skill lists do, instead, you, when making up your character, end up taking a fairly uh, uh, limited collective of them. And so, no, they aren't in the game, just like Lorenzo said, they're not in the game so that should someone try to make toast with an omelet on it, the GM will not be gobsmacked and not know what to do. But instead, it's like, oh, there's a skill for that. So we're good. The game can handle it because there's a skill for it. That's not what's going on here at all. What's really important, and this is a good thing in this case, is that we need to know what your character isn't good at. Because... You are an ordinary person in the waking world in this game. And you're not good at everything. And you may have an interesting background. I mean, you might be commando, you know, whatever. But you might have an interesting background. You might be skilled at some amazing things. But it really is going to be this collective, which is highly identity-based. And then there are the dream skills, which... Um, Kind of, they're, they're a little nichey. I mean, you kind of grade toward this way or that way of handling things in dream. And that's fine. But here's the interesting point. Dream circumstances are obviously extremely idiosyncratic. They have methods of changing, um, either by your actions or by critters or the dreamers. 
And so you end up with a shifting landscape or shifting situations. And often your real world skills turn out to be important or applicable. A good example, very straightforward one would be, okay, well, my guy is a, a fry cook. He, you know, I, I have a bunch of skills which really have a lot to do with being reasonably good at his job. And there's room in, for, in there for a few other things too. You know, maybe he's got like a model airplane hobby and so he knows a lot about the military history of the airplanes and stuff like that and he can make models and stuff you know maybe that's his hobby i just made this guy up but that's a pretty typical character for shattered dreams is somebody who's like that unless of course you want to go the full commando thing and you know he's got a closet full of weapons and he's or you know can in any minute now you know when the zombies attack he's he's on it right well you can make that guy too if you want but Anyway, so you've made up a dude or gal who's reasonably understandable. Um, and let's say in this dream situation, uh, there's a gas boiler. Who knows? Maybe it's set in a submarine or maybe it's set, you know, in a, in a haunted hotel in Colorado, right? Where there's this, this scary gas boiler. Or maybe there's any number of other situations which has this old school gas heated tank of water that is providing the heat for everything and anyway you've spent your life as a fry cook making sure not to blow up the gas boiler because you know that's part of the job whereas here in this dream you're like we need that to blow up and i can do that and so there's many many ways in which your weird little who knows maybe gluing airplane models turns out to be a big deal the point is not that the game master is engineering the game situations, the dream situations, so that that skill will be relevant. The dynamism and the unpredictable manipulations of those situations throws up all kinds of things. So the angle at which your skill set can attack them, whether you're actually shaping the dream in order to take it somewhere where your stuff can matter in some way, or whatever. And there's a lot of emotions involved. I mean, do you care about this particular dreamer? I mean, are you perfectly capable of leaving that person's mind, you know, shattered completely, you know, are you going to sacrifice that dreamer to the situation so that you can battle this monster in it or what? I mean, all these things are also playing a role. So anyway, the dream, the, the game's long and quirky skill list which at first glance seems like they just like opened a, a trade school college catalog you know course catalog and just sort of riffled the pages and just whatever they saw just went into the skill list that's what it looks like at first but when you play you recognize that this is extraordinarily powerful and that it actually having it's one of the few games in which having a distinction between attributes and skills is actually a very powerful and integrated concept rather than sort of this generic default notion that I often see in role playing. So that's one shattered dreams kind of made me take a deep breath and go, oh, okay, okay. So there's business of skills, attributes, and any kind of use of those terms as these are really dials, really dials. They are not bad design and good design we've really got to think carefully about parsing different aspects of a character sheet into different descriptive categories. Sometimes you're not going to do it at all. It'll just be a list, one down the side of the, street, the, the sheet, and perhaps generically we would call those attributes, perhaps generically we would call those skills, or there can be some very, very powerful integrations of different levels of concept. Um, okay, Shattered Dreams really got me thinking on that one. The other one from just about the same time came out a couple of years later with an extremely storied and quite disgusting uh, publication history. A game I've played a lot and have immensely enjoyed, have frequently referred to, and am always up for another game of, especially long term, because that, that's what I, where I think it really shines is zero and this came out in 1997. Now, the interesting thing about zero 
is that uh, the skill list is quite short and everyone has them. The characters are uh, hive mind members of a cybernetic humanoid society, uh, which is clearly modeled on insect hives. And uh, the, the shtick of the game is that the player character, something's gone borked in their connection to the hive mind, and now they're alone. Um, they can communicate with each other, but with no one else. And uh, they're not even used to speaking verbally. They're used to telepathy. And the, the, the game's quite well done in many ways, not least because it doesn't provide a canonical setting. It provides a set of standardized concepts and then says, hey, what is really going on there? Is this a generation ship? Is it a crashed colony ship? Is it the leftover of a post-apocalyptic event? Is it on a far-flung place that has nothing to do with our humanity? Not my problem. Come up with something that you like and make that be the basis of this. What's behind it all? What's the purpose of it all? What does the hive mind want? All those things? That's you. Okay, so I really like that about it. But what's relevant here for the skills, like I said, all the characters have all the skills, but you have one number on your sheet. It's called your focus. And briefly, um, of the skills, some of them are focus skills. And those, given the dice system, um, you're really, really good at and have a chance for extraordinary results. So then there are a set of skills that are not focus skills, but they are trained and they are, you're, you're pretty good at them. Now there is a trade-off, a, a zero sum trade-off between those two. The more of those untrained skills that you have, the less focus skills you have. And also your success is not as good with your focus. Basically, if you have a lot of the trained skills, then you end up with uh, not so great a focus. So you end up having not, you know, these extraordinarily specialized and powerful skills, but you're pretty good across a range. So there's a zero sum between those. And then there's also a subset of skills that you don't have training in. You still have them. And they're a lot like the untrained ones. You're just not as good. So... Then there are the untrained skills, which is the rest of the skills on the sheet for you, which are a lot like the trained ones, except they're not quite as good. So those are the three categories. You got the focus skills, you got the trained skills, and you got the untrained ones. Now, what kind of matters about this for Zero is that because the characters are all members of this, this hive, um, and their different specializations have basically uh, are, are a cast and are even a mindset and physiological in lots of ways. So here you are all of a sudden landed with basically autonomy um, and alienation in a, a pretty serious way. The, the game manages that well. Here's the cool thing. The experience system includes making up new skills, things that aren't part of the hive. Now, there is an interesting point that when you first bring in a skill, um, it's at one of those, it's at, it's at this, this untrained level. And so you think, oh, good, well, I'll just train it up into focus, right? Well, no, not really. Because again, if you're talking about getting more skills, then the question is, if you have lots of these, you know, get them lots into trained, that means you're pretty good at a wide variety at a level that I would consider about the same as a pretty functional character in most role-playing games. How focused do you want to be? Do you want to remain a focused, specialized creature, which means you're going to have less of those trained skills? Or are you going to, as time goes by, develop breadth with a whole bunch of skills that aren't part of the hive that you, the player, have made up based on what the character has encountered and you feel that they are going to develop as part of their new identity. 
So the whole notion of the skills, its relationship to the single attribute, that focus number, and its uh, relationship to the types of skills involved is really solid in this game. Really, really actually beautiful to experience. Um, it's one of those things where the analysis is simple, but the analysis really doesn't help you do it better. You should just do it. So zero is another example of a game in which a limited skill list, very different from the, well, you see, it's interesting, right? Shattered Dreams, you've got this crazy, you know, canonical skill list, just an insane number of skills. I mean, you don't even have to make up new ones because I'll bet you whatever you were thinking about is in there somewhere. And Zero, in which it looks like you've got this incredibly limited skill list, but in practice over time and specifically non-canonical, it's absolutely left up to the player and needs to be what will eventually be a highly customized skill list and, you know, to be added as an ongoing feature of this particular table using this game. So, no joke, skill lists can be a really big deal, a very important part of excellent, excellent design. But that's not really what we've seen through the ages. So everything that we're dealing with here in Undiscovered uh, speaks to this. It is uh, very much on the RuneQuest model, and yet what does that mean? The early RuneQuest had very few skills, and they were very strangely distributed. You know, there was kind of a rabbit hole of the alchemical skills, for example. Um, and they were still, I mean, these was early days, right? They were really struggling with what on earth is a perception role. Uh, they, they came up with dozens of things, parsed it out. There's spot hidden and there's track and there's scan and there's oh, all sorts of things. I mean, very, you know, the, the seat of their pants, right? Game by game, supplement by supplement, trying to figure this out. You know, the subroutine for finding plants also sort of proliferated and boomed and all kinds of stuff. Well, Undiscovered comes from that tradition and focuses very, very heavily on individual development, sort of creating through play, uh, kind of going back to early RuneQuest in this regard, kind of creating through play a personal tree of developing and ever, you know, uh, uh, expanding skills. So in Undiscovered, there are three skills for leatherworking, three different things. Does that, is that ridiculous? No, not really. The idea is you would start with one, you would get better at it, and if you so desired, you would you know, add those others and we get to see your character actually be, um, for lack of a better word, you know, become and focus on and self-identify as a leather worker. So is that good? Is that bad? Is it a fetish toward realism? Who knows? We're working with that now. But one thing that I'm finding and have always found in games of this kind is that what you need are situations that are absolutely rife, just naturalistically rife with content. You just, just That's one reason why working in a modern setting, setting things in a modern setting is useful because we know the place is a mess and we kind of know what sort of things are scattered around in the mess of any particular location. Um, what sort of things, what kind of people, what sort of available interactions, um, just scattered around. little harder in a lot of fantastic settings where in terms of this intuitively available and multifarious content, they can be a little sparse. So I put a lot of effort into having imagined settings and situations not be like that, using more the modern world model in my head of what a situation is like. It's whether, you know, it's big, like, a, hey, we come to town, or little, like, what's in this chest, that we're always talking about the kind of kibble of reality that reality hands us. So, therefore, um, the specificity and the limitations, the personal limitations of one's skills are still a working part of being functional in this game, especially in unpredictable ways. All right, there you go. 25 minutes of blither.
that's your fault, Lorenzo. It was fun. <laughs>